Hi, my name is Alicia Byrne, and I'm an engineer with Correlated Solutions in South Carolina. Here I'm going to talk about the general principles and theories that digital image correlation is based on. First, we'll cover 2D digital image correlation and how we use images from one camera to match and track data throughout time. Then we'll cover 3D digital image correlation. Here we use the method discussed in 2D correlation to track the images throughout time, but we use images from two cameras so that we can use stereo correlation to get 3D data. 2D digital image correlation, or DIC, uses images from one camera to obtain full field, shape, deformation, and strain data. It is non-contact. While 3D DIC allows for any shape and any motion, for 2D DIC, we have only 2D information from one camera. So the specimen must be flat and planar to the imaging sensor. Out of plane motion will cause a bias in our 2D data. So motion towards or away from the camera should not occur for 2D DIC. 2D digital image correlation can be used for a range of applications. Cameras and lenses are selected based off the field of view and the speed of the event. Here we see DIC data for a small capacitor chip that you would see on a printed circuit board next to data from a concrete wall that is several meters in size. Cameras are available for quasi-static applications, ultra-high-speed applications, and anything in between. Here is an example of 2D DIC and the full field strain data that is obtained in VIC 2D. In the line extraction to the upper left, we can extract global data as well as local data. These local areas and points are user defined and drawn here in the plot to the upper right. When using one camera, we do not have the perspective to determine out of plane motion. So any change in the size of any region on the specimen will be reflected as strain. If the specimen moves towards the sensor, it will get larger in the image and create a tensile strain bias in our data. If the specimen moves away from the sensor, it will produce a compressive strain bias. So in order to avoid bias in our strain data for 2D applications, the specimen must be flat, planar to the sensor, and must not move towards or away from the camera. Digital image correlation works by tracking points on the test specimen surface that are unique from one another. For this reason, we must apply a speckle pattern to the surface. The speckle pattern provides unique features and markers to track points throughout the surface. The way we track points is by tracking groups of neighboring pixels, which we call subsets. The subset size is user defined and should be large enough to provide unique speckle information for all the subsets throughout the surface while remaining small enough to provide good spatial resolution. In order to provide unique enough information to track every data point or subset, a pattern should be non-repetitive, isotropic, and high contrast. White on black or black on white speckle patterns meet the specification well because they are random, not directionally dependent, and high contrast. Additionally, a uniform dot size and consistent 50% dot coverage on the surface will result in higher confidence in subset matching reducing the noise and uncertainty in our measurements. Next, we'll talk about the searching and tracking of subsets in DIC. Consider this very simple nine by nine pixel image. This is not reflective of what an image of your data will look like, nor is it a great example of a speckle pattern, but the cross-like pattern here provides a simple example to demonstrate how we track a subset. Pixels are assigned gray levels from 0 to 255. Here we assign 0 to the black pixels and 255 to the white pixels. To the left, we see the pixel matrix of the image. Here we apply a displacement to the image. We can see that it has moved up one pixel and to the right one pixel. Next, we assign a 5 by 5 pixel subset on the reference image in order to track where that subset moved to in the deformed image. In order to find the subset match in the deformed image, we check several possible matches using a classic correlation function. All this function here is, is the sum of the squared differences using each corresponding pixel in that subset. We make a guess 
that the subset moved to the left five pixels and down five pixels. The correlation function results in a very high error. So we know that this is not the match that we were looking for, and we consider another point. Next, we make a guess that the subset moved to the right one pixel and up one pixel. The correlation function here results in an error of zero, and we have tracked the subset and found the match. In reality, we are looking to minimize the correlation function rather than find a match of zero because the images will always have some noise associated with them. Since we can't expect the test specimen to move in pixel increments, we do interpolate the image for non-integer locations. Correlation algorithms use gray level interpolation representing a field of discrete gray levels as a continuous spline. By default, an eight tap spline is used because it typically results in more accurate displacement information. However, lower splines may be selected in post-processing options, which will result in a very slightly faster correlation. This animation shows the result of the error function or the correlation function as we track for the position that the subset moved to. During the temporal matching of the subsets, there are some other considerations that the algorithms account for, such as photometric mapping and subset shape function. During testing, it is common for lighting to change, variations in exposure time to be present, and the pattern and dots themselves can often become lighter when stretched and darker when compressed. In order to account for those things, a photometric transformation is used in the correlation function. This transformation allows for the entire subset to get lighter or darker, but does not account for lighting conditions that are more problematic for DIC, such as sharp shadows across or within the subset, and glare and reflections on the surface. We'll cover those conditions further in the best practices presentation. In the reference or undeformed image, the subset drawn is a square. However, as the specimen deforms, the subset does not remain a square. So in the correlation function, we account for a subset shape function, which allows the subset to change shape as it deforms. In review, 2D DIC is a non-contact method that obtains local and global shape deformation and strain data. But with one camera, the specimen must be flat and not move towards or away from the camera. Depending on simply what lens and what camera is used, we can use 2D DIC on surfaces down to a millimeter in size or up to meters in size from quasi-static applications up to millions of frames per second. DIC works by applying a speckle pattern so that we have a dense mesh of subsets on the surface with unique specular information to track as the specimen deforms. We obtain data by tracking and matching subsets throughout time while accounting for changes in the subsets, such as light changes or shape deformation. Next, we build on the principles we learned in 2D DIC to talk about 3D DIC. Like 2D DIC, this is a non-contact method that applies a speckle pattern to track full field shape, deformation, and strain as a specimen deforms. But with a second camera, we can now obtain data for any shape in any motion. If we can see it and if we can speckle it, we can get data. We simply need to be able to get high quality in focus images from the two cameras in order to get full field strain and deformation data on the entire surface imaged and speckled. The large range and scale and test speeds will be similar as for 2D DIC because we are limited by the same optics and cameras used in 2D. Depending on the lenses and the optics used, we can get data for spacecraft launch structures, entire airplanes and bridges, and also data within small biological samples like mouse arteries, and also within thin bonding lines like solders and adhesives. And with high-speed cameras, we are able to obtain data for explosive events, Hopkinson bar tests, or projectiles as shown here. Stereo imaging provides information from two sensors to perceive 3D information, similar to how two eyes allows us to have depth perception. With stereo imaging, we can now resolve how an object moves out of plane, which we can't with monocular vision. In order to build 3D information with two sensors, we use stereo triangulation. Stereo triangulation 
uses known information like the locations of the sensors to compute the intersections of optical rays in order to locate features in three-dimensional space. For this, we need these optical rays to be in a common coordinate system. In order to do this, we obtain a model of the stereo rig by calibrating it. The stereo rig is what we call the two-camera system. We model both extrinsic and intrinsic parameters of the stereo rig in order to build our calibration model. This calibration model includes both extrinsic geometric parameters, such as the angles and distances between the camera sensors, and also intrinsic parameters specific to each camera lens setup, like distortions, focal length, image centers, and skew. Calibration targets with known spacing are used to build the calibration model. A series of images are taken as the target is rotated in arbitrary positions. Here we see the calibration dots are extracted automatically in the software. The calibration is a bundle adjustment that builds a model of the stereo rig parameters using the shape of the calibration target. The target shape is also extracted from the calibration images. In fact, all of the calibration parameters are extracted from the calibration images alone. No further information is needed or entered. This is regarded as the optimal method to calibrate cameras and provides confidence margins for each of the calibration parameters. A dedicated pattern recognition algorithm is used to extract the dots from the images and a transfer function for the stereo rig is built from the pair of 2D images. Now that we have calibrated the cameras and all of the stereo rig parameters are known, we can use stereo triangulation to build the 2D images into 3D points. We do this with intersecting optical rays, which we call epipolar projection lines. To illustrate epipolar projection lines, let's consider that two people, Bob and Mike, each have a camera and are taking pictures of a building across the street from them. Bob and Mike want to locate a point on the upper right corner of the building. Bob knows where this point is in his 2D image, and Mike knows where this point is in his 2D image. Let's assume that the cameras are calibrated so we know the angle and distance between Mike and Bob. Using that, we can project optical rays onto each image to find the point in 3D space. To illustrate these projection lines, let's consider that Bob uses a laser pointer to point to the corner of the building. Mike can see the laser, and that projection line is what he needs to determine where that point is in 3D space. Mike can use his laser pointer to project a line onto Bob's image too, and the intersection of these epipolar lines are what's used for the 3D reconstruction. We do this for all of the points on the image, to build a 3D model of the building. And similarly, in 3D DIC, once we've used stereo correlation to match the subsets from right to left images, we use intersecting optical rays or epipolar projection lines for all of the subsets on the test surface to build the full field 3D surface. This is matching through stereo triangulation. So we build our 3D model, but we also track it throughout time with algorithms similar to 2D DIC. Combining what we know for 3D DIC, we match the subsets in the right and left image through stereo correlation. We track how the subset deforms throughout time, and we build the right and left image into a 3D shape using stereo triangulation. Once we perform those three steps, we can track 3D models from the right and left images like we see here. Lastly, we'll talk about how we obtain strain fields. We have full field displacement information from the tracking we spoke about previously. So for every data point, we have displacements. For each data point, we use three neighboring data points to compute the strain. This is similar to how strain is computed in finite element models. Our data point density is determined by a user-defined parameter called the step size. It's important that the step size is small enough to keep the triangular meshes tangent to the surface since we are using those points for strain computations. The strains on each of these small triangles are noisy, so we apply a low-pass strain filter. This is a center-weighted Gaussian filter, so the points in the center of the filter are weighted higher with the edge points weighted at just 10%. 
While increasing the strain filter decreases the noise, we do lose some spatial resolution with larger strain filters. So the filter size is user defined. In review of the 3D DIC principles covered, we track shapes and displacements by stereo correlation, matching the subsets between cameras, temporal tracking throughout time similar to 2D DIC, and then stereo triangulation, which uses the calibration model to build a 3D reconstruction. Strain computations are made using displacements of neighboring points, and then a user-defined low-pass decay filter is applied. This is how 3D DIC obtains full field 3D shape, deformation, and strain data on any surface that we are able to speckle and image with two cameras. This has been a brief overview of DIC principles and theories. I encourage you to visit our growing library of training videos. For a comprehensive and in-depth guide to digital image correlation concepts, theories, and applications, please check out Image Correlation for Shape, Motion, and Deformation Measurements. This DIC textbook was written by our co-founders, Dr. Michael Sutton and Dr. Hubert Schreier, who is also our president and CEO. We have also contributed to the International Digital Image Correlation Society's Good Practices Guide, which is an excellent resource for digital image correlation. I'm Alicia Byrne, and I'm an engineer on the technical sales team at Correlated Solutions. We are located in South Carolina, where we design and develop digital image correlation systems. Our DIC systems and software are developed in-house where our entire team of sales, support, and software engineers are located. These DIC systems are turnkey and customized for each unique application. So please don't hesitate to email or call me to discuss your application and how we can provide you with our full field non-contact measurement solutions.